Now, please welcome to the stage our chair for the plenary one, Rod Oram, and all of our speakers for this session. Hare mai. Tana koto, tana koto, tana koto koto. Um, I'm Rod Oram, and it's my very great pleasure to be um, the um, MC for this first session. Greetings to you all in this gorgeous, historic, refurbished theatre. And I'll point to one thing in particular. Uh, if you're short of inspiration, look skywards to the dome. That's Midsummer Night's Dream, beautifully restored, uh, including a blue moon. You'll find Titania and Bottom, Ass and All, in there. Um, and um, as Shakespeare said, it's not just about Midsummer Night's Dream, it's about, as he would say, rare visions. And um, so a great welcome to you all, whether you're in this room or you're next door in the piano behind us or wherever you might be in the world live streaming. Wow, you're all here. And uh, thank you for coming so far. It's a great pleasure to be hosting you down here in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, I vividly remember about three years ago when Alex Hannant, our chief executive at Arkina Foundation, said, um, let's host the 2017 Social Enterprise World Forum. And we sort of went, um, we're small and it's very big. And then he said, uh, well, it'd be really cool. We could do it in Christchurch. And we said, um, Christchurch is more rubble than city at the moment. Um, but we have done it uh, because we have friends, they have friends, they have friends of friends. And so literally thousands of people have been involved uh, with making this happen. So thank you all uh, for being here and making that happen. Um, the really key, key, crucial part about this first plenary session is that we want to put some big issues which you've already heard about in the welcoming um, speeches, and some big opportunities on the table. You know, set a bit of a buzz, a bit of a tone for uh, how uh, we're all going to uh, work and what we'll achieve um, over these next three days. And I can't think of a better quartet of people to do that, thanks to their experience and their personality and their activities. Um, so I'd just like to introduce to each of them in turn. Um, this is Tamare To, who you met earlier. Um, Tamare is um, a member of Naitahu, um, the uh, principal tribe down here in the South Island. And uh, he's a historian and an activist. And so he's a director of, <laughs> <laughs> I could call you that, can't I? Uh, Naitahu's um, research center here in Christchurch at um, University of Canterbury. And then next to, um, uh, Tamara is Jan Owen, CEO of uh, Foundation for Young News Australians. And Jan is a highly regarded uh, social entrepreneur, innovator, influencer, and author who has spent the last 25 years growing Australia's youth social, social enterprise and um, innovation sectors. I should be saying, give each of them a hand as they go. So a hand for total. <laughs> and then a separate hand for Jan. <laughs> And next is Farmina uh, Felolini Tofunai, who is a, an international indigenous communications expert working out of here in New Zealand and Samoa and elsewhere around the islands. And her current work includes ICT and enterprise projects for UN women in Samoa and a UNDP media and nutrition uh, project in multiple Pacific islands. So a big hand for Farmina, please. Um, and then, uh, last but no means least, Peter Holbrook, who's CEO of um, Social Enterprise UK, uh, which is the national body for social enterprises in the UK, representing a very wide range of social enterprises, regional and national support agencies and the like. So a very big hand for Peter, please. <laughs> now, um, you thought you were just about to be able to settle in and go to sleep. Um, and Well, no, settle in and listen to our speakers. Uh, but we want you to be very involved and very active. 
So we'd just like to take a few minutes now for each of you to turn to the people um, around you, uh, alongside you or behind you, and just have a bit of a chat about questions like, um, why this event? Why now? Why am I here? So have that chat, and we'll have that same chat here. <laughs> Hello, hello. <laughs> uh, clearly, I've set um, a great hair running. And um, I'm just going to keep talking, because they think that something really exciting is happening down there. And they'll gradually quieten down, because they want to hear what's happening down here. Thanks very much. <laughs> um, I, I feel as though I just let loose a runaway freight train, and I'm trying to uh, get it back under control. Um, just uh, one more thing of housekeeping before we get going. Um, to uh, make this as interactive as possible, uh, we've got polls. And uh, we've got one uh, particular question um, that I'm going to ask you now. And um, if you go to the program, so plenary, plenary one, uh, you'll see at the top of that page a poll. And if you uh, just touch on that poll, uh, here's the question. How optimistic are you that social enterprise can change the world. Okay. Now, if you're very optimistic, score a 10. And if you're kind of pessimistic and perhaps still a bit jet-lagged and wonder what on earth's going on, you might want to score it a 1. Um, but do score that. And um, I, I will see very soon, uh, in fact, I'm watching the numbers uh, click up now, um, how you will score. What we're going to do is ask you at the end of the session to score yourselves again. So this is a way to put pressure on the five of us, uh, with a bit of help from uh, Rare Visions, uh, to, um, to see how we've sort of geared ourselves up for the start. Um, could we perhaps have on the screen, please, um, Kare, the um, uh, result of the poll as we're seeing it? I'm expecting kind of low numbers, because people will still be um, dodging around with the um, uh, technology. What I'm seeing here is that I've got a strong run on um, eight, which is really very optimistic. That's almost half the people here. Uh, and I've got um, nobody down below six, uh, so that's very encouraging. You're all really up for this. And we've got a few outliers out there at the ten. Uh, and um, so we'll see if we can shift things more towards the ten. Now, what we're going to do by way of starting um, is just have um, each of our um, panelists um, give a 10-minute uh, presentation, um, and, uh, or 7 to 10 minutes. And um, I'm still looking for, ah, oh, the remote magically appeared on the chair behind me. Um, and um, first up is, um, in, in the order, is um, uh, Peter first. So a very warm welcome to Peter, please. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, thanks very much. It's uh, pretty awesome to be sat here looking out at all of you, uh, and what a beautiful bunch you are. Um, I, I was going to stay seated, but I swear to God, these plants are getting closer and closer to me, <laughs> and, and I know that there are at least two carnivorous species here in New Zealand. Um, so before it starts to consume me, I'm going to stand up. Uh, so um, on behalf of um, uh, me and everybody from the UK, England, Wales, Northern Ireland, and of course Scotland, I would just like to say, Horomoe, Kiora, Tanakoto, 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 Katoa. <laughs> I just wanted to start really with uh, a few slides that really uh, look at the uh, kind of state of the world which we as a group, as a community of social entrepreneurs, uh, need to get our heads around. It starts actually back uh, here, you know. Many cultures and many faiths will have a different view of how old the world is. But our scientists uh, have, have checked this out, and apparently our planet is 4.5 billion years old. And this graph from the New Scientist just really demonstrates just how much change man has created just in the last 60 or 70 years. So from the 1950s, we've seen just about every metric go a little bit crazy. So on the graph here, you can see foreign investment, GDP, population, species extinction, uh, the average surface temperature of our planet, 
all going extremely crazy towards the last uh, 70 years of that four and a half billion year lifespan of our planet. Uh, over that period, we've seen uh, mass soil degradation. In fact, 40% of our agricultural land uh, has now been severely degraded. Although, I have to say, New Zealand's looking uh, pretty strong at the moment. Uh, over, the next 80, uh, over the next 40 years, we've got to produce more food than we've created in the last 8,000. Wow. And right across the world, we are finding our water resources becoming scarcer and scarcer. And that's only going to be compounded by uh, a rapid growth in our uh, global population. So the good thing is, the population is growing. And that means two things. We're having lots of sex, and the population is growing, and also that we're all living longer. So uh, someone born in the 1950s could have, globally, an average of 48 years life expectancy. You know, today, uh, that's over 70 years. That's an incredible achievement through business, through technology, through social and economic progress that has been achieved. But as we see the uh, population grow to an expected 9.5 billion by 2050, up to 11 billion by the turn of this century, we're going to put ever greater pressures on the very systems that have allowed us to achieve so much. Even since 1990, you know, the number of people living on less than $2 a day has more than halved. And we have to recognize that how we trade, our economies, our systems, and our approaches to business have driven so much of that progress. We also recognize that that very same economic development has put huge, huge pressures on the very biosphere on which we all depend. And this is the Stern Review, uh, which was a United Nations initiative uh, led by the former chief economist for the World Bank, uh, Nick Stern. And here we see uh, the implications that many of you, uh, particularly the younger folk in the audience, are going to have to deal with uh, if we do not change course, and radically so. So we can see that currently, in the last 60 or 70 years, going back to that earlier graph, the global temperature has increased by 0.8 degrees. And we're already beginning to see the catastrophic implications of that climate shift in temperature. We've seen across the Caribbean, across the US, across Bangladesh, across many parts of the world, including uh, in the UK, the devastating consequences, the increasing frequency uh, of uh, uh, natural catastrophes emerge. And if we continue, as we may well, to four degrees by 2050, 2070, by the end of this century, uh, we can see huge implications for all of us. And it makes the recent flows of people, the migration trends that we've seen, uh, escaping areas of conflict and uh, economic uh, challenge into Europe and into other parts of the world, seem like a mere trickle compared to what we might expect if climate change ravages the Earth in the way that it, it may well. And alongside that, we've also got this huge, huge issue of growing inequality in our world. I think this really does sum it up best of all. This was a poster. Uh, launched by Oxfam earlier this year, uh, just eight people on this planet own more wealth than the 3.5 poorest people across the world. And there is no sense of, of that really being tackled. Um, the sustainability, the sustainable development goals agreed in 2015 by all nations have reducing inequality as one of the, uh, the key ambitions, one of the 17 goals. But really, we're at a loss. Uh, outside of this room, at the very least, about how we might achieve that. Now, is it any wonder that given that context, we are seeing uh, social unrest, we are seeing conflict, we uh, seem to fear our futures, we seem to fear each other in greater and greater numbers, and that has seen some uh, pretty concerning political outcomes emerge right across the world. Um, you know, in my own country, uh, we've seen a quite introspective decision, in my view, uh, as we prepare to depart the European Union. Of course we can be localist, of course we can be self-determining, but international cooperation is a greater priority than perhaps ever before. However, uh, we're trying to drive those numbers up on your poll. <laughs> and I want you to leave this session feeling optimistic and positive about the future rather than bleak. 
So I don't know whether I'm the elephant uh, or the monkey. Um, I think I used to be the monkey. I put on a bit of weight recently. It's all this social enterprise food in, in New Zealand that I've been eating. But I am an optimist, and I can see some great, great things emerging. There is a consensus from academics, economists, from, from people right across the world, from business leaders, that actually our whole economic systems have to shift so that we are working within the limits of our natural environment and our natural resources, that we are driving social outcomes alongside economic development. And this notion of social value has been a global phenomenon that I've seen emerge in pretty much the last 10 or 12 years. And it's taking place right across the globe. There's a social enterprise based in the UK, but operating internationally. Uh, it's called Divine Chocolate. And it's owned by the Cocoa Farms in Ghana, along with uh, social lenders based across uh, Europe and some international aid organizations. And they have recently mapped their own progress against all of the 17 goals. And out of those 17 goals, this company reckons that it's only not making a positive impact on one of those goals. This business is competing with some of the largest food manufacturers in the world, and yet it's finding a market, it's finding consumers that believe in its mission, that believe in its purpose, that believe in its ownership structure, and are making a choice based on its pro-social credentials and its social impact. And we're seeing uh, absolutely, uh, you know, thousands of young people start these businesses right across the world. We've just published data. We've got 80,000 social businesses in the UK, about 5,500 of those based in Scotland, for those Scots in the room, of which, let me assure you, there are many. And out of those 80,000 social businesses in the UK, 25% have been created just in the last three years. The performance of social business in the UK is outperforming that of mainstream business. They are more dynamic, more innovative. They are more gender fair. They are more ethnic fair. There are better representations of young people, minority communities, women throughout the entire strata of these organizations. And there are an ever-growing number of consumer choices being made available right across the globe. This is not just something that deals with market failure or public service delivery. This is something that is driving and disrupting markets right around the world. And we're seeing universities and books. We are seeing a genuinely global movement emerge. And you, my friends, are the pioneers of this important movement. Even our Houses of Parliament, not known for its kind of modern take on the world, has started to buy socially. In fact, uh, uh, there's uh, Mohammed Genus recognizing the contribution uh, that Parliament has made in driving social enterprises into the heart of our government. Now, many social businesses are small. Many of you here will be running small social businesses. But my message to you is this. Together, we create something that is so much bigger than the sum of our parts. We are on the brink of expanding this revolution, this social business revolution. And we need to take that message out. Because what the world needs more right now of than anything else is hope. And just remember when we think that perhaps we are too small a movement to create the change we need to see. Phytoplankton living in our oceans create more oxygen than all of the forests in the world. These are microorganisms working together to create the oxygen that we all breathe in greater volume than any other form of oxygen creation. Thank you.